Hey, what is going on everyone? Welcome to what might just be the last episode of the big biggest tier list that I'm ever doing. But in case you missed all the previous ones, basically what I do here is I tier every single Fire Emblem character in a list. That's what we call a tier list and we do that for every single one of them until we're done. And uh, today I got the last batch of uh, January for you. Uh, we got some new mystery, we got some awakening, some fates, uh, some little, very tiny little bit of echoes, and some three houses, of course. Now, why did I say this is the last one? Uh, that's because I think I need to change up the format a little bit. And uh, I asked my Patreons what they would like to see. After some, uh, some going back and forth, I decided it'll be fun if in the future I make videos where I tag along with someone who knows a lot about a specific game and I go over the tier list with them and, you know, do the revisions that I've always been talking about as well as adding characters to the list. I don't know what tempo this will happen at, but uh, that's what I'm planning on doing. If you haven't seen that on Patreon yet and you are one of my Patreons, thank you by the way. Uh, you can look in my Patreon and there is already a couple posts discussing everything that you need to see on this. And I'm going to hold polls to give you guys as much insights, transparency, and what's that other word I'm looking for? I can't remember it. Um, input. There we go. Give you guys as much input as you'd like on this because I realize it's not quite the same as, you know, spinning specific units. Uh, but this format, I've been doing it for, I think this is episode 24, and I think it's run its course a little bit. At least I want to do something different before I come back to it because I've been doing this format for ever since I started my Patreon, basically. And it's been a lot of fun, uh, but I noticed that the views are going down a little bit, and I noticed myself that I'm like not as much looking forward to recording these as I used to. So I want to keep things fresh, I want to keep things po positive, and work on changes while I still find it somewhat exciting. Um, splitting everything up into different tier lists was one way to keep it fun for me. And this is just going to be the next step on the way. So there's going to be a change. It's probably going to be that. And um, when I'm talking about like units or like when I'm talking about like what people I go over the tier list with, um, obviously two people I've name dropped on here are um, Don Don and Rangor. They've been giving me a lot of input on these. Uh, giving corrections in the comment section, whatever. And this will be their chance to have some input as well on the mic. Uh, of course, they're both pretty busy right now, so it might be a while before you see that. And in the meantime, I, uh, I'll i find some other way to do it, or I'll just continue to format for a little bit longer. Uh, but this might just be the last one you see, so don't be too surprised. Uh, but for now, we're going to continue on our normal, uh, our normal way of working. Uh, we're going to continue doing new mystery, and we're going to do um, Awakening. We got some, uh, some Fates Conquest. We have some Echoes over here, and we have some Three Houses. So we have that to look forward to. Uh, let's start with FE12. Uh, good old new mystery. Uh, probably the game I've played the most recently because of the draft race that I did a while ago. So we have Linda. So Linda, Linda, I don't know. Uh, submitted by Furon. And then we have Fina, submitted by Hanalu75. Now, Linda in this game is really interesting. I really like what they did with her. In Shadow Dragon, I always just felt like she was just a nuke with Aura that joined too late for like real training. And pretty much all you could really do with her, especially in higher difficulties, is you just chip people with Aura from range. But if you ever had like an enemy like look at her funny, she just kind of died because of how strong hard five enemies are. Lower difficulties is a little better than that, but she's really underleveled and pretty far from promotion. And every 12, they just said, all right, you're joining right away. I mean, it's actually like Kaga who said that in book two, but it's the same concept, right? She joins early and she still has Aura and she has access to Nosferatu and a lot of stuff is really fun. Now, most of the playthroughs I've been watching lately or I've been doing lately or more like Lunatic Plus, there's a guy called Reploids who is actually playing an FE12 um, Lunatic Reverse Iron Man right now. And uh, he just lost, lost Melissa on Chapter 7, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, but most of the time it's been with no deaths whatsoever, it's pretty impressive. And I saw he's actually using Linde, kind of training her, which is interesting. Uh, I've discussed here a little bit uh, with Rengar at one point because I was considering using her for my own lunatic playthrough that is on hiatus right now because Jesus Christ, that difficulty is so, so painfully slow to play for me because it's so hard. And uh, she definitely needs an angelic rope ASAP to survive. And with stat boosters, if you have the budget to give one to them, it's in your best interest to give them ASAP. 
And what I mean by that is like the Angelic Rope that you can buy from the prep shop if you've cleared Lunatic Mode on your cart before. Uh, you can buy three of each stat booster in the prep shop. And one of these is an Angelic Rope, which you could give to Linde. And that will let her like survive a single enemy. Because higher difficulty enemies in FE12, they just oko Linde if you don't give that to her. And that's nice because it opens up like the door for Nasratu tanking, which is really interesting on Lunatic Reverse. Because um, if you do it there, um, like normally when enemies at low HP, you just think, okay, I'm going to finish them off. So I can use like anyone, I can use like a Mermanon with an Iron Sword to finish them off and it'll be fine. But Lunatic Reverse, the enemies all basically play like they have Vantage or Vantage Plus, so they all just strike you first. And uh, Nosferatu kind of says, okay, that's cool that you just hit me, but I'm just going to get my HP back anyway. So that's kind of a cool thing that Linda can do in higher difficulties. Um, other than that, you could just kind of use her as normal. I have mostly fond memories of using Linda in FE3 Book 2 and giving her like the stars for late in the game. And uh, that will prevent her weapon from breaking because that's what it does in FE3. It just, like, it just turns your weapon into a Fates weapon, I guess. It stops giving, like, lowering your durability. Uh, but it doesn't make Nasrat as bad as it is in Fates, where it can't double or anything. So it's still super powerful. She just nukes everything that way. I'm sure you could pull that off on some of the lower difficulties of FE12, depending on, like, what kind of HP threshold you need and, like, how fast Linda needs to be to double. Um, Linda is not a unit you can use on, like, really fast playthroughs for the most part, I think. Because her movement is generally so low in the magical classes, and you're better off with like physical units for the most part, especially mill units, because they have more flexibility with reclassing. Uh, but as far as magic units go in this game, I would say she's pretty good overall. Uh, not a whole lot of staff utility going on, because she has no existing staff rank. She's not as versatile as a unit like Wendell or uh, Etzel, uh, but I'd still say she's trainable and usable. So. I don't know where exactly that puts her. I want to say like somewhere around C tier is probably still reasonable. Like she could probably be about as good as Elrin is when he joins. Less bulky but with more interesting spells to have access to. Because like Elrin can use Excalibur at some point probably but not right away. Uh, but Linda has like Aura and uh, Nosferatu to her name. Uh, I think she's better than Frost actually. And with like with regards to these two, these two are like low investments, somewhat okay return kind of units. Whereas Linda is like really someone you have to put work into. That ends up good, but it takes a lot. But again, Nosferatu is like one of the very few ways you can have like a productive, uh, but also safe enemy phase in FE12, I feel like. So in that regard, I think Linde is uh, one of the, like, she definitely has a niche going on. I just don't know exactly how to rate it because FE12 is not the game I have the most experience with. Uh, that goes for most of the games in this in this batch usually. Uh, but for FE12 high level especially. I love watching it. I love people like clear it really well. I love commentating down on FE12 um, 0% growth playthrough. Um, but it's not the game I've played the most. Um, the highest difficulty I've cleared to this day is still hard one. Unless you count my hard two Iron Man. Uh, which you shouldn't because I didn't clear it. But I came close. <laughs> I came ridiculously close. So yeah, I'm going to say C tier for now. And this game will definitely be up for revision at some point. Uh, then we have Fina, who is a dancer. So that basically tells you where she should go basically right away. Uh, I don't know if like S plus is the right tier for her. She should be like S minus more like. Um, I'd Rating dancers compared to like really hard carry units like Chris and Pal is always difficult. I don't think she belongs all the way up there with the Chris, so I'm just gonna put her here. Hope that satisfies. I could see down here, I could see like here, uh, but I'm gonna go with here for now because dancing is really hard to replicate. Like literally, just ask Zane, it's really hard to replicate. Uh, but it is really good in this game. I think it's one of the better games to be a dancer, kind of like Lorem. This game has a lot of really powerful staff effects, especially late in the game. Uh, some of them are removed for Lunatic, like Warp. Uh, but this tier list is not supposed to be based on just Lunatic. I just mentioned it a lot because it's on my mind. But I try to take into account multiple difficulties, even though it doesn't always lead to a very consistent rating of units. But um, as far as Fina goes, like just the extra mobility is nice. This game doesn't even have rescue dropping or anything. So extra mobility is something that not all of people can give to someone else other than using like the rescue staff, which is also something that dancing makes better. Uh, of course, if you do have warp available, that is also something that Fina can dance for. Like, Fina is as good as your best unit, your best action on any given turn, as long as you can protect her. And she can do that most of the time. She can also walk on water in her class, which can be pretty nice in some chapters, like Chapter 10, the chapter where Wendell recruits Elrin. And uh, there's some other ones as well where I think the water walking can be relevant, but that's the first one that comes to mind for me. A uh, similar class to Zayn and Marth in that regard. I think it's pretty cool. She can use swords. I just wouldn't recommend it. Like... This is not a game where you can just dodge anything reliably anyway, so even against Axe users, I wouldn't recommend ever having Fina see combat. I don't remember what her growths are, I just remember her bases are absolute trash, and really, isn't that all that matters? So, um, yeah, Dancer good, really good in this game. I think she's better than um, FE7 Indian, for instance, 
I think she just has more to do, more interesting things to do. And uh, I would definitely use her in every playthrough. And I was really sad when she died on my Iron Man, because... Uh, well, also because like everyone else died at that point, but that was definitely the one that really, really hurt. So, yeah, that's where we'll put Fina. Let's uh, move on to some good old uh, Awakening. Alright, next we have the Awokenest Fire Emblem game, Fire Emblem Awakening, with only one submission, but it is a very good submission. It is Owain Dark, one of the best characters ever have been invented. Um, a bit of background for people who are wondering why I all of a sudden like a character from Awakening and Fates, in case you missed it. Um, I just really grew a liking for Odin. Uh, I've never actually really played with Owain, but I do have a couple of funny stories about him. Or like a couple short, like like anecdotes, I guess is a better wording for it. Um, first of all, a while ago I did the uh, all Fire Emblem games stream thing, where I streamed every single Fire Emblem game uh, over the course of like a bunch of different streams. And uh, the Warriors one, someone actually said, hey, Mecha buy the DLC and just donated the money for the DLC straight up. And I'm usually not a big fan of DLC, but the Warriors DLC does have a way in it. So I bought it, I leveled them up. I started rocking with him, and it was a ton of, ton of fun. It's the same moveset as Ryoma, and Ryoma is one of the easiest characters to use you know, in Warriors. The game is easy in general, but he's really, really good and really, really nice. So that was a lot of fun, and uh, I've never... like I, I have played Awakening twice, or maybe three times total, like finished it all the way through. I might have started like a couple playthroughs, but those don't really count. And in all those, I don't think I ever recruited or raised a Wayne, because back when I did, my, my mic is doing weird things. Hold on. Yeah, so um, back then I wasn't really into Owain. I only really got there when I was doing my Conquest Lunatic playthrough and watching Zoran videos and stuff. So I kind of missed out on the on the Owain Dark memes and the, the Fell Hand or whatever stuff. Um, so I don't really have any experience using Owain. And that goes for most Fates kids. The only ones I've really used are uh, Morgan and Lucina and... Uh, it's not entirely true. I think I've, I've made like a couple more. Uh, a long time ago when I actually made trips, like cross-Atlantic trips for vacations, uh, like once, twice, maybe three times in my life, um, I would be very bored on the plane and I borrowed a friend's Awakening cartridge at the time. So I was able to play that and uh, I actually grinded like a lot of Awakening characters back then. Uh, I think I paired... Uh, I, th I think I paired Olivia and as a result I did uh, like grind Guild Force to her, I think. Like really time consuming stuff like that. I definitely paired Sumia. So I have some experience with Awakening Kits, but I have no experience whatsoever with optimizing them. And for like it's a pretty involved meta game. And all I already know is that Guild Force is really good, but it just takes like too much time to get in non grindy playthroughs. I said that before. So I'm just gonna put away in that kit tier. I have already this like this weird C tier. Or I'm not sure really sure where to put him exactly. I read up a bit about him. Apparently, um, Lissa as a parent makes him a better magical than physical unit for the most part. Um, or apparently that's what a lot of people think. I tried looking up FAQs about this, I really did, but that's... I mean, looking up FAQs basically puts you on game facts, and you, we all know how that goes. Uh, they just recommend Guild Force on him, and that's really all they write. Um, but yeah, apparently Sage Owain is interesting, which is funny considering what happened to him in... Uh, uh, what's it called? Conquest? Uh, but on that, I can't really say a whole lot about building kids themselves. And, like, very, very customizable units are the hardest ones to rate. That's why the Three Houses tier list is such a pain to make. Because everyone is so customizable. And in, in something like Three Houses, there is, like, one class that everyone is really good at. Or, like, you can basically put, like, 70% of the class in it. And the other 30% are, like, mages or support units or that kind of stuff. So everyone just kind of falls into place based on that. Uh, the more, like, if anything, Awakening and Fates characters are more customizable. And they can go like more different ways and that makes them even harder to rate because where do you even start? You need to have some basis of comparison. Um, you need to agree on pairings or like setups that are like the best before you can start comparing them. Or you need to like take the average of all the viable builds. Um, the same problem to a lesser extent happens with F4 kits, but those at least are roughly the same whenever you get them and uh, however they're raised. But Awakening's reclassing system just makes it all over the place, so that makes them very hard to rate. Uh, that's why I have to, I'm probably going to just kind of throw all the kids in here. There might be some that are like notably worse than others because they unlock at different times. I don't think Owen is unlocked that late, but don't quote me on it. Uh, but it's okay because he will lend a fell hand in the C tier. Uh, let's go on to some, uh, I think it's time for Conquest. Yeah, that looks like Conquest to me. We have five candidates for Conquest, and I knew Jacob would make an appearance here. Uh, let's see, Hantas submitted Jacob, uh, Letter Shield Merrick, and Lazy Bison both submitted um, Shura, so I'll make it up to you guys. I'll just talk about him in both Conquest and Revelation. Uh, but I think I did 
agree to only tier them based on conquest and not on revelation. Um, but I'll talk about him just you know just, just because it was double submitted. Uh, then we got Zana submitted by Great Dane and Gaius submitted Nyx. So there you have it. Uh, we'll start with Leo. I haven't been able to use Leo for a full playthrough, but he does join in the middle of a chapter. And I think if there's one thing that really helps units get themselves out there, you know, advertise themselves a little bit, is joining in the middle of a chapter. I think I've talked before about uh, some FE12 units, particularly I think it was like Dice and uh, Maris. Yeah, I think Malice basically. And their problem with like not being known, apart from being like one of the most obscure Fire Emblem games possible that's only in Japan, is they never force deployed and they never get the chance to show you're never forced to use them in battle but leo joins in a pretty busy chapter in conquest where you have all incentive to use him and you get to see how good he is you get to try out his personals a little bit uh he comes with a personal tome uh you can see how good that is like when you have a unit on the field you're so much more inclined to try them out that's why i enjoyed joining situations like uh like tilt and fe4 where you're really incentivized to take advantage of wrath whenever you fight those pirates those kind of situations i think are make fire Emblem interesting and I think that's another reason why Three Houses characters feel so samey all the time, because all of them are in the same maps all over the place. Like, there's like maybe three units in the whole game that have some have an actual joining situation. Things like, I mean, I guess the Lords and Byleth, but I meant more like Gilbert and Yuritsa, maybe, I guess. Um, like, there's no joining situations, and those I really miss in Fire Emblem. I hope they, those come back at some point. Um, but yeah, can we actually talk about Leo? I guess we can. Um, I like Pragmatic as a skill, sort of. I mean, I, I prefer the other variant that's like it that does more damage when they have full HP. I think there's one like that too. Uh, Pragmatic is pretty interesting, more damage when they're weakened, I do believe. Um, I also like, um, I would also enjoy if you had like Maruka's personal that's like more damage if you don't counter face a counter attack, but that'd be kind of too good, I guess. Uh, I like that Leo's kind of bulky. Uh, I find that usually people that talk about Leo kind of just want to compare him to Odin for some reason, and that's kind of it. I'm never one to do class by class things, but I do see why. Uh, there's actually like a pretty interesting video by Zoran where he talks about um, where he plays on the on the ship chapter, the, the Shura boat map, and he like compares how Leo does compared to Odin and uh, Ophelia, and what the advantage and disadvantage of both are. Um, he's of the mind that units like Odin and Ophelia work much better because they've been able to invest in their supports and build up like I think weapon rank building is also an argument for him although it doesn't seem like a particularly strong argument against Leo considering how high his rank is there was something else he was building up that I don't remember uh, but it was definitely at least about supports um, like oh uh, getting skills that's right getting more skills onto his kit where like Odin can get like advantage at that point for example and I do see those advantages and I can see why Leo wouldn't be able to keep up with that at the same time Leo doesn't require the investment that Odin does so um, that's like a counterpoint that usually like weighs against units, right? Is it better to have a unit that joins later um, for free, basically, with no investment at that point? Or is it better to have a unit that is available for longer, that you can make use of longer, and in the process you invest into them? Because I think there's one thing that Zoran's videos show very well. Uh, like you can talk all day about like how they don't reflect something or how they... Um, how he over optimizes things or how it probably takes more longer to plan out the chapters than it's actually worth um i do think he has a good point that um, you can use like almost every unit in conquest at their joining point and they're not really a liability uh you can use every kind of using conquest to help you and also still get exp um i think for basically every chapter that odin is in he's made like some kind of video showing that off so in that way, I don't think Owen is like a burden. And it's only a matter of like, is he worth the XP you give to him? Or would you be better off like benching him and playing like with one less units and just having that investment to go to other units? But we're still talking about Odin here. I guess I'm still in, in Owen mode. Um, I, I do think Leo is pretty good when you have him, but I don't have the adequate experience to like really properly skill him to where he is. Uh, but I do think I want him in the same tier as Odin. Uh, I do think Effie's early game utility weighs out over Leo. Uh, I do think by the time that um, Leo joins, Effie might actually be outclassed by him. But uh, I still think I'm okay with this order here. Um, I also know for sure that there's people out there that think I'm actually overrating Odin, that he should be lower than Leo. Which I don't hate, or even Ophelia, or anything. But uh, this is definitely one list that needs revision, because again, Conquest, not my area of expertise for sure. But um, I do think Leo is like solid. I think he's pretty good. Uh, the mobility that he has, um, just being a pre promote is nice in general. I think your master seals are actually like sort of limited at this point too. And I think Leo's like reasonably good at base, 
without any investment and he can just gets better with investment too so yeah that's where i'm at right now and uh he's got a cool personal tone then we have jacob and as far as i know in fire emblem conquest meta games there's like a couple different schools of thoughts about like where jacob should go class wise he can go he can stay as butler which i've done a couple times i'm not super happy with that in the long term uh, i appreciate like the the stack utility in the late game like reclassing him to um, the strategist, I think it is, where you have like a high move rescue unit for the end game. I kind of like that, but I do feel like it was a bit underwhelming, and it could have been like almost anyone. Uh, for the most time, I like use Jacob as a para bot for Corn, just to get the immediate bonuses, which I think is great, and it gets you like a fast wire, which can be helpful if you want to use him. Uh, I never really did, uh, although I I did use him in like both my playthroughs, but I never really like used used him. I didn't like fully invest into the wire. I wasn't really going to use Dwyer. I just kind of had deployment slots for him. He was more of a filler than anything. A filler kit, if you'll believe it. Uh, but I feel like Jacob on his own, like, becomes much better if he's reclassed to Paladin or, uh, like, Malik Knight or Draco Knight. What, can he become a Wyvern Rider? I think so. Uh, but I think usually people advocate either Paladin or Malik Knight. I do love the Paladin skill tree. It's got a lot of good skills, like uh, Shelter, Elbow Room, and that stuff. Uh, he can pick those up and then go to something else, I guess. Um, but where exactly he goes, I think. Yeah, I think uh, the reason I have trouble experimenting with this kind of stuff is when I'm playing a game semi-blindly or playing a game I'm not as familiar with. I have trouble, like really. Uh, I, I just kind of, I almost fall into pitfalls, I guess we'll call it. I have a huge case of uh, fear of missing out, FOMO, as well as just sunk investment cost. Like I just kind of feel like I need to dedicate to something. Uh, like make a decision on something and just kind of stick to it because otherwise if I change my mind uh, I think, feel like I should have done that earlier which I mean if you're making a bad decision and you want to go back on it that's probably better than keeping going with the bad decision but somehow I still convince myself usually that's a good decision in Jacob's case for example um, I remember holding on to second seals or giving them to other people over Jacob even though Jacob was probably one of the better recipients just because I feel like I was, I'm just not going to be second seal Jacob this playthrough. I'm going to keep him as a butler and as a pair of bot and like a staff bot. And if I wanted the paladin Jacob, I should have reclassed him earlier because if you make him a paladin, you have to work with the low weapon ranks that he gets at base. I think he has like E rank in both. So unless you have like forged bronzes, it's just not going to do a whole lot. So I feel like if you want to do paladin Jacob, you should commit to it early. I still feel that way, but maybe I should have reclassed him because he felt awfully mediocre. My first playthrough though of Conquest, my actual first like finished playthrough, where I started on hard and ended on normal. Um, Paladin and Jacob got really RNG blessed. He got like really good strength and speed. I've been told it's like way above his averages, and it was really really powerful. I have both him and Silas as a Paladin. They both got RNG blessed that way, so sometimes I had trouble telling them apart. And I really had a good experience with that. So uh, yeah, I think Jacob overall, if I wasn't like clear on that in the first place, he's he's really good. I like a starting class. I like the like the the weakening ability, the debuffed ability with the knives. I like the stack utility. I like the skill that he has, that he gives the core and the bonuses. Uh, I just like that he's available very early. And I think he has a lot of good reclass options. You can do a lot of different things with him. And I mean, if the, if the fandom is arguing about which is better, and they're still arguing, like, what is it, like five, ten years after this game was released, uh, it's probably a sign that it's somewhat balanced at least. I'm pretty sure there is a superior option in the end. But um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with Jacob. Not sure if he's like quite S plus tier, if it's like more like an S minus. My feeling is S minus, but I'm free to be proven wrong. I'm uh, not entirely sure if he's that much better than. I'm pretty sure we've had, uh, yeah, Felicia on here. She's only like a C tier. That might be a bit low. Um, I think I'm gonna move her up to like the B tier at the very least. She's not that bad, and I'm not. Wanna, I don't want to penalize her for like making you lose out on on Jacob or anything, because that's not the way I rate units. So I think I'm gonna raise Felicia a bit. Uh, but yeah, definitely one of those lists I need feedback on as well. Um, next we have Shura, as I said, double submitted, so I did use him both in Conquest and in Revelation before. And fortunately Shura is like, he joined to a pretty high level in both, so it's pretty like hard to be misinformed about how good he is, I guess. Um, I did pick Boots in one of my playthroughs, in my first Conquest playthrough, because well, of course Mecha's gonna pick Boots, even though it's plus one move. But, you know, having used him in, in Conquest, I definitely think that Shura is actually better than uh, Boots. A common thing people often say that I think I've addressed on this before at some point is that why would you ever pick the Boots? Sure, as better because you can pair it with someone and give him possible move. I think that's a misconception. I think you can 
easily justify it because if you kill off Shura and get the boots, you get a plus one move item that you can use on someone that you can still pair up with someone else to get plus one move. So Shura still increases your mobility. It's just like using boots on a flyer and then being like, okay, but you can just give boots to a foot unit and then you have equal move to a flyer. Like this, that's not how boots work. They stack, <laughs> you know, they, they stack on someone. You can still give someone extra movement with that. So with that in mind, I do think picking Shura is the move as long as you think he has added value to your team. Um, like, speaking like in arbitrary numbers here, if you have 10 deployment slots and you have already have 10 units lined up or planned out that you reckon are going to be better than Shura, in a vacuum, you would never need to pick Shura. You just take the boots instead because if Shura is worse than your 10th best deployment slot, then there's no reason to pick him over the boots. You might as well just make your 10 units that you have better. It's almost never going to be the case though because Shura is actually really good. Uh, I remember for, like, the particular thing that I remember him for I was in the ninja map and I just learned of this trick from Zoran where you uh, put Xander in front of a guy with a bow and the ninja AI refuses to attack Xander because his defense is too ridiculously high. So they will attack whoever's behind him instead if that's like their only targeted range. And if that's a bow user then they can just, um, they can counter them. So it's almost like your bow user suddenly has an enemy phase. And you can use Niles for that if he's trained, uh, but I didn't have a Niles that was trained enough. My Niles was like level 15 but unpromoted, I don't think I had a master seal to spare for him. I don't think I had any other trained bow users too. Like, I, and I think you can have like a trained Mose with that point. Other than that, Conquest is kind of lacking in, in, in good bow users at this point in the game, I think. Um, trying to look over like what the options there are, but it's not that many. Uh, even if there are, the point is you can use a bow user this way. Um, I used Shura that way, and I thought it was really, really good. Um, I keep thinking Shura starts as a ninja for some reason, but I'm pretty sure he starts as an adventurer. So you could just use him at base, uh, might take like a tonic or something like that, but generally um, I think you can just do that job at base, just one out ninjas in an enemy phase, and depending on like pair-ups and cooking and stuff, uh, you can even make him double after getting debuffed, uh, which is what happens when he misses, but at the very least you should be able to kill one ninja on enemy phase, and even if he doesn't, you can take a little break, uh, you can move him backwards and ninjas just won't attack Xander, I think, they just refuse to attack him. I do believe that's how it works. It's kind of stand there doing nothing, and uh, that's how you trivialize chapter 17. I I was pretty amazed when I first saw it, and when I tried it out, I botched the strategy a little bit. There was a couple of times where I had to reset because I fucked up. Uh, but the strategy is almost idiot proof. Like if I'm able to pull it off in Conquest, a game I'm super bad at, then uh, it's pretty good in general. So if you ever have trouble with the ninja map again, I do recommend checking Zoran's videos out and trying that strategy up for yourself. Xander can also do that on his own. To be fair, he can um, either use like the Siegfried or something else to just kill these enemies. Um, even after getting debuffed, he's still fine as long as you give him the right, like, he's just stacked defense bonuses on him basically and speed bonuses. You can even double in 0% growth from what I've seen. Regoros is like the screenshot of a, um, like, base level Xander that just doubles and one-round kills a ninja using the Siegfried, I think. Uh, like a master ninja in 0% growth. It's super stupid. Um, but Shira can be helpful if you're not interested in doing the Xander solo thing. And uh, I like him for that. So, yeah, Boots is good, but Boots is better, I guess. Um, I don't know where that ends up putting him. I want to put him, like, around Leo's level, because, like, when you think about it, I think he joins, like, a little after Leo. Uh, I do think Shura is, like, easier to train overall a little bit, if that makes any sense. I also like that he can get Shuriken Breaker at some point. I think you have to reclass him for that, because I don't think I could keep it in Adventure. I think I have to make him a Bow Knight for that. And I think I ended up getting it just after the Ninja map. So I didn't get to like try that a whole lot, so I'm not sure how good Shuriken Breaker actually is. It seems kind of okay. Uh, I used different measures to deal with the uh, the ninja map with Ryoma. A uh, lot of ninja map. Of course you're not getting um, Shuriken Breaker by the time you get to chapter 17. This is about the Ryoma map. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna put him like around here. I think uh, B plus is fine for him. I, I do think he's pretty good at base. Uh, it's not that many units in this game that I think are like super good pre-promotes. Uh, the ones that I have are mostly in S tier already. So I think this is pretty cool. Most units seem to need, like, need like more investment than Shura does. Then we have Azana. I usually don't really think about Azana. In fact, every time I played Conquest, people had to remind me like 5,000 times in the comments section to get a hot spring and recruit him. And I just, I don't know, it never feels like a priority for me. Until I start thinking about rescue skipping endgame and I start thinking about, uh, yo, I kind of want more staff utility or honestly just getting more... Um, things like Untrap and Freeze and that, those kind of utility stabs. At some point in the game, these like, really start to matter. And you want to get a unit like him on your team to use those. I haven't found his combat really worth. Um, I actually found his personal to be really detrimental and like annoying to work with sometimes because whoever he's like next to just does like two less damage, I believe. Like they do less damage. 
and that's been super annoying for me sometimes. So I've really had to work around that. Thankfully, like the staff ranges in this game are absolutely insane. So you just have to worry about it too much as long as you're using those. Um, like it's like it's like a very cool personal skill. I like skills that have a drawback because it also makes them take less damage. So it's like a it's like a peaceful ability. It's a very it, it really brings out the best in Izana and his personality when it's like it's it's very in character for him. But it's also like you can't just brainlessly do it. Like something like um, I don't know, someone just has a plus 20 free turn. Like, think of like Ignatz's skill from Three Houses, where he just, his skill is just plus 20 hit. There's no, there's nothing interesting about using that, except for the part where it lets him like use worse weapons, I guess. But there's no strategy in applying plus 20 hit. You just get the bonus and that's it. Uh, for Azana, if you want to get a benefit out of the skill, you have to deal with the drawbacks. I think that's very cool. Uh, you might not want it for every character, because it does make the game much more of a headache if it, um, if like every skill is like that. But I do really appreciate skills that have a drawback, um, as minor as they can be. So, Azana, I don't think he's great, but I do appreciate the staff utility. Um, I do think it's worse than the Felicia, because like Felicia can just do, use all the staffs he can, but earlier. So, I want to put him like the higher regions of C tier. Uh, but I think like this, a lot of this is availability, okay? Let me just get that out of the way. A lot of this is availability. I do think he's pretty good once you get him, just because free staff utility is pretty good. And last, we have uh, Nyx. This is a unit that I, well, I mean, obviously I don't have much experience with her because I didn't use her in any of my playthroughs. I know a couple things about Nyx. I know that she can promote fairly quickly if you want to. I don't think she's worth it from what I've seen. It's just not worth giving her the Master Seal. I actually watched um, Chest Jump Ball's 0% Growth playthrough, and he used Nyx in, like, base Nyx in the Chapter 10. And I think she was single-handedly able to handle the right side of that map, like just by herself, going out there and handling all the bow users, and I think some soldiers as well, some spear fighters, pretty much by herself. I don't remember anyone helping out. I was very impressed because she was unpromoted. So she just kind of did that by herself. That was pretty impressive. Um, other than that, what I've ha heard from Nyx is mostly her say, like, she's a pretty okay pre-promote. I feel like at that point, Master Seals are sort of precious, and you want to keep him around. Um, for units to, you know, once they've trained, they want to, like, promote, like, once they've reached, like, well, 15 or something, you want to promote them. Or, uh, you just want to pre-promote someone else, I think, like, that you actually want to use, like, long-term. Uh, although I have had, I've used some of the units as, like, pre-promotes before. I promoted Silas in my Iron Man run, and that was going to work until he died. <laughs> I, uh, I got a Stefan Seal, and he died. Uh, but it, he was looking pretty good before I killed him off. Um, I think I promoted Selena before in that chapter. I might have actually promoted two people, actually. I might have used, like, the in-chapter Master Seal on Selena and uh, the, the Master Seal you get before that on uh, Silas. I think that's the way I did it. Um, I don't know why I'm not pointing at Silas right now. Uh, but the point is, the point is, I think the Master Seals have more uses, and I think taking one is an opportunity cost. And if you're not using a unit in the long term, I don't feel that's worth it. And if you're going to use one, I think there's better targets for it. So, uh, with that in mind, I want to put next, next like, like kind of B minus C something C year. I'm just not really sure what to do with her. I don't think she's especially good, but I have no idea what the long-term prospects are, honestly. I do want to check real quick what her personal skill is because I forgot and I'm always interested in these and I think they can really tell set the character apart, but I don't think it's been super great or else I would have heard about it earlier. <laughs> uh, let me just check real quick. Counter Curse. When enemy triggers the battle, inflicts magical damage, the enemy receives half the same damage. Oh, counter magic, basically. Okay, that's that's alright, I guess. I don't think that's particularly great. I think there's much better personal skills in this game. So I don't think that really changes her ranking any. Um, so yeah, that's where I rank Nyx, roughly. So, oh wait, I forgot to talk about I forgot to talk about Nick about um, this guy's revelation rating. So if it were to rate Shura in Revelation, I think I put him a bit higher. I think I put him in like A plus. Uh, or A minus, because he's like a really good pre promote in that game. Uh, people always, funnily enough, it was it's actually about Shura and Nyx. Whenever people talk about like the balance in a game and how bad it can be, they always point to Shura versus Nyx in uh, Revelation. Because in that one, Shura joins at like what is it like level fifteen pre promote or something, or like a really high level pre promote in the same chapter as Nyx, and they both join with their their conquest bases, but they're in the same chapter now, even though they normally join like very far apart. So Shura's bases are just like off the bat, you just use them and he just destroys everything. Or at least he's very, very good. And meanwhile, Nyx is like uh, <laughs> ridiculously terrible. Um, I don't remember exactly what chapter number it's in, um, but it's quite a bit later than what she does in vanilla, I believe, with like worse bases by comparison. And uh, that sucks for Nyx. So Nyx would definitely be like an E tier, I think, in uh, in Revelation, compared to Shura, who is obviously like really, really good in that one. I use him for the longest time. I don't think in my Revelation, I don't think I did a single interesting reclass in that run. I might have trained like, I might have changed a like, Korn or Jacob and that's about it, like Paladin Jacob or something. 
that might have been about it. Um, but Shura, even in his base class, was really good for me. Until I got to the map where I think every enemy changes class. It's like that... I'm trying to think, is this... The, now, this is definitely the one where every enemy changes class from promoted to unpromoted or vice versa, depending on what room you're in. And I was playing that one, and I think Shura was on his way to a chest or something. Because uh, he has luck touch, so I thought, you know, might as well get, let him get the chest. Or at least I trusted him to do stuff on his own. I don't remember if he was even paired up, but this one enemy just kind of run up to him and just crit him with like a 1%, like a literal 1%. And uh, that was definitely a highlight of a highlight playthrough. That was uh, that was great. I love using my characters like way in. And this is one of the few games that I can't save scum in with like save states and stuff to save myself the time. I'd actually have to replay the whole chapter just for sure. And it was all the way at the end, so I was like, fuck that shit. We're just playing on and we'll add Shura to the many things I lost um, to this Revelation playthrough along with my brain cells. Story of Shura. Uh, but yeah, really, really good in Revelation, though. If you're ever playing that game, I don't know why you would, but if you're ever playing it, I would definitely recommend using Shura on that one. He's super good. Okay, uh, Echoes. Con uh, yeah, Conrad. <laughs> the last character of Echoes. We're out of characters from Echoes, so this is the last episode. And it's also the last episode where we have, you know, Shadows of Valencia, which, you know, I'm going to miss it. Such a great game. Um, Conrad, I made a lot of fun of Conrad during my Echoes playthrough. I really really don't like the fact that he's in this story. Um, ever since I said that though, I've seen some people post defenses in my comment section. I've warmed up to him a little bit and I'm sort of okay with it. I just, I feel like Celica has been made enough of a damsel in distress that like she's already been made dumb, look dumb pretty off by the story. And then they added Conrad to like save her butt like two times and like warn her against her, uh, against something and he just, she just ignores his warning and ends up in trouble and he ends up saving her. Even though there's like, there's like 5,000 characters in her army that could have helped with saving her. Like, just give that to Saber. My guy needs more screen time, or Kamui, or Felbar, or anyone really. But no, they had to have Conrad White Knight in as Saber, and it just really annoys me. Um, as a unit, I'm also not a big fan of Conrad. Uh, so I remember some people would recommend Atlas to change the Cavalier just to be get a, like, a Paladin in Celica's maps. And I'm like, dude, do you really want a Paladin in like um, Swamp and Desert City? Now, Conrad joins like after the desert. There's only like a couple swamps left, but there are still a couple left where he's not that great. I can see him doing some work in the chapter like Duma's Gate where there is no swamp. But I just find his stats to be a bit too lacking. Um, he comes with like the Bright Lance, but that thing is like no might. So even though it's supposed to be effective against monsters, it doesn't really do a whole lot. And... I just don't think it's worth giving him like one of the good lances for an enemy phase when you can just give it to Palai or Catcher at that point. We should be promoted and pretty good. Uh, I also like using Est better even because she flies around and you can mean with triangle attack and stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons I would prefer using Est over, over Conrad. I don't know if the con is actually worse because he does have like a better... He's like promoted at base, I guess. He's like a Paladin class. Can become a Gold Knight in theory. I just think it takes forever. Um, like, let me see what level he is at base again, just to make sure I'm not, like, completely wrong here. Uh, but I don't think Conrad is, like, super worth in Echoes. I don't think he's very good. I just want to see real quick, because he needs to get level 10 to promote, and he joins at level 7. So that's not, not, like, super far away. You can't do it. You have, like, the resources to do it with, like, fountains or just XP feeding. He gets a little bit of bonus XP at the end of the map. He's just deploying him. So it's not impossible to get him there. I just don't find it worth it. And I don't think his stats are good enough to really warrant it. Um, but I've seen him like do some things at base like he's not he's not so bad you have to like protect him all the time but she compared to like untrained units like if you don't train someone like Forsyth he's gonna be a really big liability Conrad is not like that but he's still not very good uh, I'm gonna put him like at the top of D tier I think uh, I could see S being better than him though uh, I also like I actually like Valvar and or utility better than like Conrad's did utility so you want to do it like this yeah, I'll take the excuse to put Est over him. I'll take it any day. Um, I'm fine with putting him over Forsyth and Sonya, though. I think that is fair. Okay, um, that's Shadows of Valencia. Uh, definitely one I'm going to look forward to revising when we get there. And then last but not least, we have the Three Houses gang. We have Hanuman, we have Baltus, and we have Happy. And they were submitted by uh, Bespito, submitted Hanuman, and then Blue Caterade submitted Balthus and Happy. So... Again, thank you guys so much for your support. I appreciate it. So Hanuman, a lot of people don't like Hanuman as a unit for tier lists, and I'm, I'm definitely one of them. I don't think I would rate him very highly. He does have his uses. Um, I just want to draw your attention real quick first to Eltrank's videos of Hanuman doing 
everything you ever want him to in three houses. Like, he just has boss kill compilations of, like, every kind of Hanuman you can ever think of, killing, like, every boss and important character in three houses. It's super funny. Um, he has him, like, as, like, a sniper and as, like, a, a grappler and um, as a... There's, like, one more, like, a Swordmaster with Astra and then just say, like, I think it was Warlock Hanuman that he used him as or, like, Dark, Dark Bishop or something. Uh, that was actually like apparently the hardest one to get because the rest all get like really good combat arts and then Astra is a combat art I guess. Um, it's not good, but at least it kind of works for boss killing if you just rig crits. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that was a lot of work though. There's a lot of investment. It doesn't really he doesn't really translate well to real play. Like he's not as good as it seems in those videos. But those videos are super fun to watch. You should you should definitely give him a look. I'll if I remember it, I'll put Altrank's name and channel somewhere in the description or something. Um. Most of the time, what people see of Hanuman, I think, is they have like their house and you get like the students they want to recruit. And at some point, you can like just kind of get Hanuman through having Bilath as a high enough level. I think most people have him at a high enough level to where you just kind of talk to him the first time you can and he just joins you. And I think I remember the first time I played Three Houses, I was like, oh wow, uh, he's probably a pre promote that I can just put on my team and he'll be good to go and I'll be nice. Uh, but Three Houses is kind of stingy with you in the slot, so I wasn't sure if I wanted that. And when I saw Hanuman, I was pretty sure I didn't want to use him, because he's just a mage. He's not like particularly high level. He's like a, was like a level 8 mage or something. He's really not that high level. Let me see what his base actual level is. Okay, so the first time you can recruit him is like level 50 mage. That's like, it's not terrible, terribly low, but it's like, dude, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> um... Like, just give me an actual pre promote. Make him like a. I don't know. I was expecting a Sage or something, I guess. I guess I was expecting something more like Pent or Sally, and I got, um, like, an Urk that's been leveled up, I guess. Um, he does have a really high base reason level of B, and an interesting, like, high level bow. So, I actually like the idea of making Hanuman a sniper and just using, like, the. The magical bows. Like, I think it's actually called the magic bow in this game. Um, or doing something weird, like, uh,. Uh, grappler Hanuman using like the aura knuckles to hit on res because as a physical guy he's probably not going to get the job done like his base strength and stuff is just too bad um, and it makes it might seem tempting to just use him as, as a magic user but I think if you're trying to use him as like just make him use his reason powers then realistically all he really does is meteor once or twice and provide supports like linked attacks and he does have a look a lot of supports with the black eagles in particular where that would be useful, uh, but I think if you want to like actually have Hanuman fight things, he's better off in a physical class, and that makes him more interesting. Um, I don't know if it makes him good. I don't think it actually makes him good. I think I put him like somewhere around the D tier, like the higher D tiers, I guess. Um, I put him like somewhere around here. I don't think he's better than Casper, because um, Casper's such a pain to train, and out of house he's just you recruit him kind of late, and I do think he's better than Trash. So we'll put like Hanuman around here. Um, definitely has his uses, but in the, as a mage kind of guy, I think it's just meteor and it kind of stops there. He has Thoron at base, which is pretty good. I, I do like Thoron. Uh, he also doesn't have meteor immediately, which is a shame, because that means you have to actually like, either tutor him or just wait a while before you get it. So it like, cuts it to the time he's already good for. Um, yeah, Hanuman is not that good. Um, I'm going to move Yuri up a bit, because people got mad. Um, I'll move him over Mercedes just to make Mercedes look worse, I guess. Um, I, I like the authority thing that he has. I like that he can like dodge tank stuff. Still not super impressed by his uh, booms and banes, but I can see him work, I guess. We'll put him in here for now. Uh, then we have DLC characters. Now, again, I gotta warn you. I, I've played a lot of Three Houses, but I still don't have the DLC, and I'm happy I didn't, because the DLC was kind of... Eh. I did play the, the Shin of Shadows campaign, though, and I did enjoy using both uh, Baltus and Happy. I think I've said from the start, I actually like Happy a lot, just design-wise. Uh, so I do have a certain fondness for these characters. I just, uh, I just don't have any experience with them in the real game. And uh, I'm going to stick to that because, you know, principles and stuff. Um, Baltus, I will say, I really love his personal skill. Like, plus six attack and defense when he's below 50%. That's like a better version of Defiant Attack and, def and Defiant Defense in one. Like, okay, dude, calm down with your personal. That's really good. So, when I see that, I just think, okay, cast Retribution on the guy. Um, put him below, like, half HP. Uh, give him, like, Vantage Wrath or something and just watch him destroy everything. Alternatively, I guess you can like go grappler and just, you know, he's the king of grappling. He want, might want to grapple. So just like, what is it, like a one two punch or a triple punch or whatever it is, just kill everything. Uh, maybe make him a war master if he wants to. I don't feel like Warmock is particularly worth it. Um, I guess you can get like brawling avoid plus 20. Or as some people call it, um, pay to dodge because <laughs> it's like a DLC class. Um, Warmonk is his class in the, in the DLC in Cinder Shadows campaign. Uh, but I think it's a bit misleading because I think he works in like other classes but better. Um, the half magic uses and like the lack of real healing power I think kind of hurts. 
but um, it's fun to use him and the, the relic-like thing that he has. I don't actually know the, the backstory to his relic at all. I've never watched a playthrough of the, of the paralogue with the story and everything, so I have no idea what the deal with those is. Um, but they don't seem like the only thing that he has going for him. Um, but they were fun to use in the Sinner's Shadows campaign, don't get me wrong. He's, um, he was pretty strong there, actually. He just kind of punched people in the face and oftentimes destroyed them in the process. So, yeah, fun unit to use. I like his personal skill a lot. He's pretty ridiculous. Uh, he really gets to work. I've seen him in Zoran's playthroughs a little bit in his Golden Deer run. Um, so, I would like to put him, like, near the do is kind of where I want him. I do think he's worth, like, a B plus to fairies. Maybe he should be an A minus, honestly, like, along with these. Um, he's pretty solid. Um, I'll put him, like, here, I think. Maybe even, yeah, I don't mind him over Petra, actually. I don't mind that either. I think he's pretty good. Like, the personal really sets him apart. Um... As far as I'm concerned, you do have to be like you have to manage his HP properly. But I think I've not like if I can if I can get away with that with that for Bernadetta, you can definitely get away with it at Baltus. And uh, the ba the boon in brawling and everything kind of works in his favor, I think. And he has, he's got a fairly solid build going. Uh, something else I want to note real quick because I was reading up on these units and uh, I read I reread the the meta guide that Rengar wrote for his uh, <laughs> cap at his website, um, fe3houses.com. Um, apparently, if you recruit him as a fighter, he gets like free bow rank because he um, fighters his level in bow rank. Same reason why Bernadetta can join with a reasonable axe rank, even though she has a bane in axes. You just recruit her, I think, chapter three, and she'll be like leveling up as a fighter. She'll be, like a level nine fighter. If you do that there, he gets like a free bow rank, and that's good because I think he has a bow bane. Uh, but that way, it's easier to get into curve shot and master of art, mastery archer, and get like hit plus twenty, hit plus twenty, that kind of stuff. So. If you're looking to use Balthus and you haven't done it yet, um, I definitely recommend that as the way to go. Whew. And then we have Happy. And uh, the thing with Happy is, well, first of all, she has the best design in the game, hands down. Like, you just can't, you just can't go wrong with that. She's got spells. She's got a lot of good spells. She get like Swarm and Banshee and Warp. And I don't think she gets rescues. Well, that seems like a real overkill, but I definitely remember her getting one other good thing. Um, Physic is good. Seraphim, I guess. Uh, she has the personal ability monsters appeal to like bait monsters towards her and do like more damage to them. It's pretty interesting. I usually don't really fight monsters on enemy phase. I try to just player phase them for the most part. So I don't know how useful it is in practice, but it just seems interesting to have you that can bait them. As long as she doesn't get one rounded by them, which I fear might be an issue for her because magic classes are just kind of slow. Uh, but like I said, I haven't used her in the main campaign, so I don't know how realistic that is. Um... Uh, Warp is like obviously really good, but she gets it at A rank, and A rank is really high, particularly because she doesn't have a faith boon. So I've been told, um, I, I haven't had the opportunity to try, but I remember from training other characters in faith that it can take a long time if you don't have a boon in it. So I think that hurts her long-term potential. Like, the whole idea with Warp is that you're going fast, but if it takes forever to get to the point where you can go fast, it kind of defeats the purpose. And if you're recruiting like someone else to use Warp for you, you can get like Lysithia or Linhart, or even like Manuela, and boost their magic instead. So you don't really need Happy to do that kind of thing. And then she also has an Authority Bane, so it's a combat unit that kind of hurts her and like her ability to get good battalions. I do really like her as like an ambassador of the Valkyrie class in Three Houses, because that class is all kinds of kick-ass. Like mounted magic, but in advanced instead of in the, uh, the master department is pretty cool. Like normally someone like Lawrence or Hubert, they have to like get to the master ranks level 30 before they can even use writing. And I remember my, my first playthroughs, I was usually just focusing on their like faith, authority, and reason too much to realize, oh, we actually need like lances and writing all of a sudden. <laughs> and there'd just be no time to turn them into a dark knight. And meanwhile, um, if you have the, the DLC, you can just use like the advanced classes to get writing built earlier than that, because you'll gain writing rank during combat. I think that's pretty cool. Um, obviously, when you have the DLC, the whole meta changes. I said before when I was reading uh, Constance that um, you can't really compare these non-DLC characters that have really been rating as if the DLC didn't exist and then just throw the DLC characters in and expect it to be like the balanced metagame because that makes it look like Constance's X to Darkfire where she doesn't but realistically Flame for example gets better with Darkfire too and in that way there's like a couple of other characters that can make use of advanced class. Like, for example, Lawrence, um, normally he'd have to wait until level 30 to be a Dark Knight. Uh, but now that the um, Valkyrie... Well, in this case, it doesn't count, because Lawrence can't be a Valkyrie. So there's probably a better example than that. Like, maybe Marianne is a better example, I guess, because she's got, like, the the mount, the, the riding boon and everything. Uh, Lawrence was a bad example, like, normally. Like, Valkyrie is female only. So, yeah, Marianne. Uh, now you can get, like, Valkyrie and Marianne, for example. So that makes things different. But I'm not going to, like, move them around for that, because... Uh, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to reevaluate re everything with the DLC in it. So we'll have to figure out how that goes with revisions. Um, but yeah, Happy... Um, I'm not sure like how good she is overall as a 
combat units, kind of like other than against monsters, obviously, where she outclasses a lot of units. Um, I, I think that like the, the spell utility is nice, like something like Swarm and Banshee. I think they're particularly good in the early game, um, but they have some utility later on, I guess, especially when you're fighting monsters. So I'm not gonna like bench him quite yet. Um, I'm assuming she's like quite handy with the Thursus, especially if you can get her on a mount and you have like a really flexible magical unit. So that seems interesting. I just don't know how high to rate her and I do not like the Authority Bane at all. So uh, like a B minus might be generous, maybe more like along like these lines. She feels like better than these because like she's got such spells going, but no more. Uh, I guess we'll go like around here somewhere. I don't know. I know FED on his tier, she put like Happy and S tier and people got kind of mad over it. I don't think she's that, that good. Uh, I do think she's more like a B something tier. Um, but yeah, not in the familiar enough to give her like a proper rating. Uh, I really liked her in Sinner Shadows. I wish she didn't die in one round to everything. But in that campaign, she was particularly nice to have and uh, really fun to use, especially with long range. And uh, yeah, really, really, really fun class to use. But it's not a personal class, so I can't really like count that in favor in her main game performance. So. Yeah, that's uh, that's it for these uh, these five games. Is I think is what we did today. Uh, although a lot of them were only one character, so there's that. Um, hope you enjoyed. And if I do another one of these, and I said there was the last one, but let's say something goes like horribly wrong, and uh, the people I want to hang out with end up being busier than expected. Uh, in that case, you might see more of these. But the plan is for this to be the last one that is in this format because I want to like shake things up and do something new, something a little different. I elaborated on it in the beginning, so I'm not going to repeat all that. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I will see you guys next time. Thanks for all the support. And um, if you want input on future videos like this, make sure to check the Patreon feed. I don't know if you have email notifications on or not, but um, that's where I post these kind of updates. So um, I already put like a poll for what game to revise first and it's looking like the first one to be revised is Radiant Dawn so that's definitely going to be a game we're visiting a lot lately between Let's Play and the character guide that I made and then the tierless revision that I'm planning on doing so yeah you have a lot to look forward to I guess it's a Radiant Dawn themed time of the year and uh, I'll see you guys there for it peace around and goodbye